Good morning. It is September uh, the 8th, uh, 2016. I uh, hope everybody has had a good week. Uh, graded quizzes will be given back tomorrow on Friday uh, by late afternoon. Also remember, quiz 2 will be posted uh, by morning uh, by 9 a.m. Uh, let's talk just for a few minutes about America's Gilded Age. This is a very important and also very exciting period between uh, the end of the Civil War and uh, the 1890s. So when we think about this, this is the history of America's uh, uh, Industrial Revolution, the Second Industrial Revolution, and uh, the settlement of the West in the late 19th century. And we want to emphasize, uh, and the textbook will emphasize for you as well, uh, that a, ma a majority of Americans become wage workers. The traditional dream of economic independence that you and I have uh, becomes really obsolete. And during this Gilded Age, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, for Americans to view wage labor as a temporary stop on the road to becoming independent farmers or proprietors, etc. The in Industrial Revolution also is, uh, is dependent upon the exploitation of the working class but as well the tremendous growth of the, ur uh, of the urban areas of the United States, the tremendous growth of a national market. Um, individuals become extremely wealthy and, and become captains of industry. Um, we can see for example with Andrew Carnegie, uh, John Rockefeller, Henry Frick, and a number of others uh, not to mention Cornelius Vanderbilt and, uh, uh, as well um, begin to really develop uh, the country in new and interesting ways but uh, to speak just briefly on this issue of exp economic exploitation this is very important because you see during the Gilded Age this tremendous growth that is being produced is, uh, by the masses, yet they're rarely able to partake in the fruits of their labor. So you have people who are working 10, 12, 14 hours a day, six, seven days a week for very little pay and often in dangerous working conditions, leading to a situation in which uh, approximately uh, 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 the 1% of Americans control the overwhelming wealth in this country. This is something you should hear, uh, should be familiar to you today as we hear uh, how much uh, money and power uh, the 1% in this country have in the 21st century. So you can have a little bit of an inkling there as to how serious this situation was. And that issue of having severe economic inequality is dangerous to the fabric of a democracy like ours. So this is why politicians talk about it a lot. This is why activists talk about it a lot. Is because when people feel that they are being cheated, when people feel that they are not uh, able to move ahead, that there is no opportunity for them, then they become very edgy, very cagey, and ultimately begin to turn on the very people that are uh, elected to uh, public office, that are elected uh, to, to state and federal offices, who uh, uh, are the governing bodies uh, of this country. So uh, when you think about uh, this issue, uh, this is very, very important. We'll come back to this uh, a bit later. Uh, after the Civil War uh, and during the Reconstruction Era, you see the development, for example, of the railroads. The railroads are one of the most important things in American development. Connecting the United States from one end to the other not uh, does not just transport uh, goods and people but ideas so ideas are important as well people are going to try to break out and some of them do from the social confines of their homes back east or in the south for places in the west 
in the Midwest, in the Southwest, uh, trying to make a better life for themselves. People are going to be lured from their homes uh, to the cities. So think about the workers who are simple farmers and they get a pamphlet or they see their posters talking about the need for workers and what uh, will be the garment industry of New York and Manhattan. And they go up there and they find, oh my goodness, look at all these people, look at all these buildings, uh, this is going to be wonderful. And then what they find out is that they've sacrificed the independence that they had on the farms for the harsh life of living in tenements. They were often filthy, drafty, cold, hot, uh, problems with sewers, problems with clean water, working for companies that exploited them every single day, often forcing them to rent from them, uh, to use their general stores so that they could get the money back from them that they had paid in wages. And then they find that because they used every little bit that they had to get out, they have nothing uh, or no ability to return to their lives on the farms. So this issue of uh, uh, progress is exciting and it's important, but there are also drawbacks to it. So understand how important the railroads are. Also, you need to think about the issue of uh, how, at this point in time, the, con the physical appearance of the United States begins to change. So if you were to go into New York in the early 1800s, you would see uh, a city that was wood, maybe some brick and stone, uh, relatively small in comparison to what it would be. But by the end of the 1800s, in the beginning of the 1900s, you're going to be getting to see skyscrapers, large buildings, because Manhattan is only so big. The boroughs of New York, think about Staten Island, think about Queens or Brooklyn or the Bronx. These are places that have a finite amount of land. So if you can't build out, then you build up. And this will continue on all the way into the 21st century where you still, if you were to go to Manhattan, uh, you would see these huge buildings from one World Trade Center that replaced the old tra uh, World Trade Center destroyed in the 9-11 attacks to uh, the Stat uh, Statue of Liberty out there in the harbor to this uh, the Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building, uh, and a number of other physical structures. Uh, so you build upward. Um, and new techniques are going to help uh, with that, the building of the, of the Brooklyn Bridge, so on and so forth. And then, of course, transportation. How are you going to get people from point A to point B? You can't have, even in the late 1800s, uh, a city like New York, which has hundreds of thousands, millions of people in the metropolitan area without having transit. How are you going to get these people in and out? So developing uh, transportation is going to be important. And what we find out during this process is, is that most government facilities uh, or entities lack the uh, wherewithal to make a uh, uh, to take on the new change of progress and development. So government in this case is behind the ball, behind the curve in terms of uh, the industrial revolution. Another thing you see is the development of political machines. For example, uh, even as late as the Civil War, Boston is still basically the uh, financial capital of the United States, but by the 1890s it shifts to New York. And as you think uh, uh, about this type of development, um, you see that uh, uh, the immigrants who are going to be coming into the United States from places like Ireland, uh, places like Italy, places like uh, South, uh, uh, South and East uh, 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 Europe, uh, Jews and others who are coming in here are going to develop uh, political machines along with uh, more traditional Americans. And these political machines are really interesting because they, there's a responsiveness to uh, these machines that you wouldn't think would be there. For example, if you were to look at uh, Bosch Tweed, for example, in New York, 
you would see that his power rests on the support in no small part of the people under him. These could be precinct captains, these could be ward, ward uh, bosses, etc. All the way down to the foot soldiers of the machine. And uh, So somebody's father died, somebody's wife or kid died. There would be help uh, uh, possibly from them. There would be jobs for, for a lot of them. There would be coal in the winter. Uh, things of that nature. Uh, but they're inherently corrupt at this point in time because of a lack of public uh, policy and law regarding corruption and graft. So this is how you can have somebody like Boss Tweed basically getting kickbacks and bribes for millions of dollars. Uh, things today that would be illegal. And this is a period of, of pure, if you will, as close as America will ever come, pure capitalism. Unfettered capitalism. Capitalism without regulation and it's going to be disturbing to see what how this goes uh, how this takes place uh, and and how important this is going to be the politics of the Gilded Age are are such that you see uh, that the nation uh, is really an island of political democracy in a world that is very de undemocratic um, Political corruption is rife, not just in New York, but throughout the United States. Urban politics, uh, especially. Um, the politics of the center really dominate American uh, politics at this time. And every Republican president, really, um, and candidate, from the end of uh, the Johnson administration to the McKinley administration, uh, are, are veterans, really. Of, uh, uh, of the Union Army or the Union cause. Uh, the South is dominated by Democrats. Um, the parties are usually closely divided and national elections are very close. And this is also a period in which you have increased participation in American politics, which is a very good thing. In 2014, around 40% of all Americans that were eligible to vote voted in the congressional elections. However, in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, all the way into the 1920s, you have upwards of you know 80, 90% of Americans who are voting. One, because, well, there's nothing else to do. There's no TV, there's no internet, there's no technology like that. The other aspect that you have is that uh, people have, and um, people feel like they have a, uh, a need to participate. Okay, people want to participate, people want to vote. And political campaigns are almost, you know, these comical sideshows in certain ways. For example, in Tennessee, you see two brothers who are basically campaigning throughout the, the, the state playing their fiddles. Uh, these were public events, um, and you had to be witting, you had to be able to uh, think on your feet. The idea of Gilded Age presidents during this period is to not so much control or regulate, but it is to, um, how should I say, to be a business agent for the business community. And the national, uh, the national uh, political structure, uh, just like the states proves ill-equipped to deal with the radical and transformative changes that are coming about here in the United States. Um, as early as 1883 began to start seeing the first regulatory moves by the Congress and, and the federal government. We see this in the aftermath of the assassination of President Garfield with the Civil Service Act which means you have to have some type of basic skills in order to take the job. Congress passes the Interstate Commerce Act, uh, and of course in 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act is passed to ban practices that would restrain free trade. And this was a big problem, because this unfettered capitalism, uh, unregulated capitalism, led to ruthless, brutal, cutthroat competition and monopolies. So if you were to look at John D. Rockefeller, you would see that he not only swallowed up all the oil production in this country virtually, but the refining process as well. And because of that, he can almost do whatever he wanted uh, because he had such control over that, um, including uh, suppressing his competition. Uh, so the Standard Oil Company 
which its its bastard children uh, are basically uh, Shell, Chevron, Exxon Mobil today um, dominates American uh, energy production uh, between the 1860s uh, and the 1910s when uh, when it's eventually going to be broken up into the little companies that I just mentioned uh, and standard oils of each respective state uh, that they operate in. So I do want you to understand how important that type of thing is and what will be called trust and pools that are going to be developed. Now what undergirds all of this is the issue of social Darwinism. And this may be on an exam, everyone, so please think about this. The issue of social Darwinism. When Darwin puts forth his theory of evolution, uh, whereby plants and animals uh, uh, are, that are best suited uh, to their environment took the place of those less able to adapt, well, that issue is applied to the transformative things that are taking place here in the United States. So, for example, uh, if you find a bum in uh, on West Market, excuse me, West uh, Walnut Street next to ETSU on Thursday night, and he is uh, laying there drunk as a skunk, uh, the idea today would be, oh, we've got to help him. We may need to get him into a 12-step program. He may need AA. Uh, he may need a hug. But if you were to think about this as a social Darwinist, you would say, leave him there, that's where he belongs. If he was better character, if he was higher up the evolutionary chain, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, and you apply this not only to that, but in that type of example, but if somebody is poor, well, if they were better, they wouldn't be in that position. If they had better character, if they, if they were better, that emphasis on better uh, they wouldn't be there so if you're rich that's where you belong uh, you you deserve that you're better suited for your environment and that this was a natural process in human society in nature and don't you see what they're doing is trying to justify the inequality that's taking place also this has a very nasty effect in terms of racism sexism uh, anti-semitism and other uh, uh, various uh, forms of bigotry. So you can see this as a justification for the suppression and oppression and repression of African Americans. You see this in terms of the vicious stereotypes towards Jews. You see this in terms of the the attitudes and behaviors toward women. Uh, you see this towards our neighbors to the south in Mexico and South America in the, in the Pacific, the Pacific Islanders and the Asians. Um, uh, you see this towards the Irish, particularly between 1840 and the 1890s, uh, those really those first 50 years since the potato famine, where you see this development here as well. Um, and of course, under this, only white is right. Uh, everything else is, is suspect. So when you have a social Darwinist like William Sumner uh, talking about his belief, if you will, that freedom required a frank acceptance of inequality, that becomes very troubling. So when we talk about 2016 economic inequality, we are also talking about this issue, which is still very much with us, of social Darwinism. And that issue of social Darwinism leads into some other nasty areas like eugenics, uh, like Nazism, like the Holocaust, like the programs in East Europe, uh, the persecutions of Jews and others. Um, this is a, a, a moral, excuse me, an immoral justification often for bad behavior. Uh, just a couple other uh, things uh, before I close, and one of which is you need to think about uh, the response that's going to come to this. As reporters, m journalists, uh, academics begin to go to places like New York and they see the tenements and they see what will be referred to as conspicuous consumption, right? The idea that uh, we're going to buy up all kinds of stuff and it's going to be like a monopoly board and we're going to go to these ritzy parties and things of that nature and then people look at the contrast okay for example and how the other half lives and uh, they see pe children who are starving they see children with diseases they see 
thousands and thousands and thousands of workers every year losing their lives thousands more who are grievously injured children who are working in jobs that are for adults or at that time for men who by the age of 25 if they live that long they are they have the bodies of 50 year olds uh, the lack of education and the virtual enslavement in the mind of people to plants to mills to factories to mines so on and so forth on a side note this is in part why you see the attraction particularly among some of the foreign uh, uh, people here in the United States the immigrants towards issues or towards the idea of Marxism uh, when Karl Marx writes the Communist Manifesto he's in no small part taking on the Industrial Revolution arguing in part that it is a dehumanizing for the proletariat uh, to be basically melded in with the machinery so when we talk about unions, for example, unions are a part of response to this. Muckraking and expo explo exposing the problems with this so-called progress is going to be uh, important uh, as well. So I want you to think concretely about what this means, how important this is to the body politic, and how much it bears similarity to what uh, we are dealing with today in terms of the decline of, of, the, of uh, industry and industrialization and the rise of the information technology age, the rise of machines and tech, uh, computers, smart uh, devices, etc. that allow for uh, 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 muscle labor jobs to go uh, abroad and for those who have college degrees, those who are well connected, those who have certain skills to profit while majority of Americans uh, remain in a position of suffering. So as you think uh, through this, understand that uh, all of this is important for the development. This is really the beginning of the modern uh, United States as we would know it. Um, and as you consider that, consider that the United States is going to soon be looking at uh, growing its influence and power abroad and going from a backwater nation into a first world nation and, and a global power uh, uh, in what will be referred to as the American century. So thank you all. Hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend and uh, uh, I will uh, talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.